introduce our host, our team. So the core community team consists of Francine Maloney, who's here as a co-host, um, who is an implementation and ethics specialist, and Rochelle Bernacki, who is the associate director of the Serious Illness Care Program, and Anna Kennedy and I are implement our project assistants. And then our today's presenters are Rochelle and Francine as a co-host and John Yu. Um, I'm very excited to welcome them. Um, John is an associate professor of medicine at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. And he's a scholar in improving the quality of goals of care conversations. And he's also an early partner and implementer of the Serious Illness Care Program. Rochelle, as I mentioned, is the associate director of the Serious Illness Care Program and one of the palliative care faculty members at Area New Lab. She co-led the program's flagship study at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Thanks, Kyan. Um, so we're excited for everyone to be here. I'm really excited for Rochelle and John uh, to lead this discussion in training and coaching. It's actually one of um, the questions we get the most about is can you train, can we train, how do we train? Um, and so we're just excited to have this. Before we dive in, um, we just want to, you know, remind everyone where we've been and where we're going. So we did have a webinar about a month ago, and um, this we sort of paused in the middle of our series and just did an introduction. Rochelle and I uh, were able to do this and an introduction to the program. Um, so if you haven't seen this, it is available on the Community Practice website. And we've really just described the Serious Illness Conversation Guide and an overview of the program and how, you know, all the pieces fit together in the purpose of the guide. So we encourage you to, um, if you're new to the community, otherwise you can certainly uh, take a look at that to begin with and then maybe go through some of the other webinars. Um, so, oh, I have the wrong. I will move the slide. Um, what, sorry about that. What you shared though about training, as I mentioned, is you are training colleagues. We're so excited by this. Uh, conversations can't happen without some training and coaching. But you have questions about training um, and a lot about what we learned along the way. Um, and so this is what we're hoping will uh, help in this webinar. So our objectives for today, um, and Rochelle and John, as Kyan mentioned, will walk through these, is to describe the teaching methods of our three-hour clinician training um, on the guide, to discuss adaptations of the training program for different clinicians in different contexts. I will say that's what a lot of people have shared as well. How can we adapt this? Um, where are different ways to make it work in our clinic? And then finally, uh, to share these success stories as well as challenges that we've heard from all of you. Um, Michelle's going to take over in a second, but again, just to go over where we've been and where we're going. Uh, this is really exciting because we're looking at the, the green ribbon phase right now, the, the line part. So it's right where that little arrow starts to come in, clinician uh, training begins here. We've spent spent our time sort of in the teal and the blue. Um, so Rochelle and John are really going to um, start to move us into this next phase. I will say Bill's described in the teal <laughs> section is still planning for training and coaching. So you, there is a lot of work, um, not a lot, but there is work that you'll have to do in the plan phase to think about, you know, what is your approach to training? How will it work before you actually walk out the door and start training someone. Uh, just to quickly again go over webinar functionality, I know Kyan just did this. Um, so again, we really hope this to be interactive throughout and we know you all have a lot of questions. Um, on the right hand side of your screen, there's a chat function. Uh, feel free to chat to um, any of us at any time and we'd be happy to answer your questions or share your stories. Um, there's also a Q&A. It's a very similar feature, so uh, you should be able to see that as well. And then there's also a little raise hand icon, which is the under the participants tab. Um, we're gonna, we do have the phone lines on mute just to cut down on background noise. But if we see that you raise your hands, we'll uh, work to unmute your line so that you can share as well. So uh, please, feel free to use any of those functionalities. 
So I'm going to hand it over now, though, to Rochelle, um, who's going to go through the first objective, which is really about teaching the serious illness communication guide. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. And we're delighted to have John here, who has uh, so graciously agreed to talk about how he's used the guide to teach in his setting at the hospitalist. Um, so uh, I want to start with talking about um, the program in general. Now, there's multiple tools that are involved in the program, the Serious Illness Guide, the Reference Guide, the Patient Materials, and the Family Guide. But today, we'll be talking about the, um, the training of clinicians, which is one of the highlights of the program. Of course, there are all the elements of system change that need to happen, and we know that training alone is really not enough to uh, implement sustained change. Um, but today, we'll be focusing on uh, training. So we've outlined the training in 10 steps. And, um, you know, they're, they're really uh, designed to uh, to engage the participants in the material. So uh, we start with introductions, have everyone in the room introduce each other, reflection, which is uh, about emotional engagement. Then we give people some information, um, some evidence about why conversations are so important. Then we do a demonstration and de debriefing. Then we explain the guide. Um, and then we... Um, break up into small groups, and it's really important to create safety in that role play situation. Then we come back together to share uh, share elements and uh, reflections on using the guide, and then, and then lastly, talk about how they'll actually use it in their uh, practice. Oh, so we have a poll before we go to um, far into the presentation, we'd love to interact, as I mentioned earlier. So we're hoping to get some information from you. We'll deploy the poll. Um, right now, you should see it. So the first part is just, have you trained anyone on the use of the conversation guide? Um, and then there's actually a few more questions underneath. You'll see it on the left-hand side of the screen, the first one. If yes, who have you trained? And then there's a few more, which is, how many clinicians have you trained? And how well prepared did you feel to conduct a clinician training? So there's about 30 more seconds to answer that poll, and then um, we'll review the results together. All right, so the poll is going to maybe just close for you, and we're going to um, look at the results quickly. So it looks like actually all of you have trained someone on the use of the guide. Um, you've trained physicians, nurse practitioners, nurses, social workers, um, about, yeah, half other colleagues. Um, so how many... The third question, sorry, it's hard to see these um, on the screen. So how many clinicians have you trained? Um, most of you have trained either 21 to 50. That's about 25%, but the majority is over 50 clinicians have been trained. And then the final question is how well prepared did you feel? And um, you were all felt very well prepared. That's amazing. We can't wait to hear your stories um, on how that went. I'm going to hand it back over to Rochelle um, now that she has all that amazing information. Great. Um, to go on. Okay. So, um, so we'll start about uh, why we why we use the methods we use to teach. Um, we start with a reflection. We ask people to um, share their stories about. Um, their, the role of communication in the, the type of care that patients get at end of life. 
And we found that that's really been very powerful in engaging um, the participants emotionally. Um, and it sort of centers them. We often, you know, are giving trainings uh, in busy practices where, you know, clinicians are being pulled in a million different directions. So this ability to sort of reflect and share a story really centers people and sort of puts them at the, uh, at the, at the table and really thinking about what we're trying to do here. We do have a brief didactic, and I think the challenge with that is really to make sure that um, it's short enough uh, that you don't eat into your practice time and your modeling time, but you really want to give the, uh, the, it, the clinicians involved the background and know what the uh, evidence is for uh, communication training and its importance in, in um, making sure that patients with serious illness get the kind of care that they want. Then you have to at least show people what you're talking about so we demonstrate the guide. Um, we've had various teams uh, do different things. Some teams use the video that we have available on our website, um, or uh, you can do a live demonstration as well. And then the, the crucial thing is to make sure that you have enough time for a skills practice. Um, because by and large, our evaluations always show that uh, the most important part of the training is the skills practice. Um, so uh, as you can see, we sort of labeled each of the steps uh, with uh, what uh, method we're using. Um, and I won't go through each of these in, in uh, detail, but they are um, very deliberately chosen. So um, the challenge with doing a reflection, we, at least uh, when we train our, our teams, we really ask them to share an instance on a communication about serious illness care goals had a positive or negative impact on care. Um, I think, you know, the worry of this is making sure that someone will say something. And I think people worry that no one will say anything. I think if you give people enough silence, people will speak. Um, the other challenge with doing this is that someone can sometimes say too much. Um, Often, you know, people will bring up stories that are either very emotionally challenging for them or personal stories, and you have to be careful um, to be sure that people feel like it's a safe environment. Um, if you feel like someone's kind of uh, talking too long, you can um, thank them for the story and try to uh, redirect uh, the, the information, um, and then you can check in with the participant you know, before you go to the role play and make sure that they're, they're doing okay. So um, our interactive didactic, you know, is really to present the evidence uh, showing benefits of conversation and then to describe the elements and rationale of the serious illness care program guide. Um, this really, using this didactic really creates buy-in from clinicians about demonstrating the importance of conversations, and then just showing them the reasons for the way the guide is designed is really um, helps them understand it cognitively. You know, we, we very specifically start with a permission statement and then ask about illness understanding so we can get a sense of where the patient is. So we have a, another permission statement. These are really all um, things to, uh, so that the clinician understands cognitively how, how it's working. The demonstration is crucial. So um, the nice thing about showing the video is that it's just 10 minutes or 12 minutes and you know exactly how long it is and you know that the person in the video is going to follow the guide exactly. Um, sometimes using a video might not be as engaging as using one of your participants in the audience or someone that you've trained um, to, to demonstrate using the guide. And um, I think it's, it's a nice opportunity if you have the bandwidth to um, to let people sort of see their skills in action. Um, I think you really keep people's attention with a live demonstration as well. The debriefing is really important to just uh, elicit the attitudes of the people in the group and hear what they saw, uh, to hear what they saw. So you wanna identify practices that people found effective and then also um, let people share, you know, their skepticism. Some people, you know, they really have a very uh, important attitudes about using a guide for a conversation and important 
attitudes about concerns about not following the patient's lead. It's really important when people uh, do a debriefing to acknowledge valid concerns. Mm -hmm. So if someone says something like, wow, it just feels really, uh, you know, wrong to, to not talk about, about the patient's pain right in that moment. And as long as you acknowledge the importance of what the patient's saying and, and saying that you'll come back to it, it's okay to stay on a guide. So you have to really acknowledge everyone in the group's concerns and worries about using this. Um, as well as, you know, the other thing, I think it, uh, the other thing is to highlight what people found useful about it. Many people find that using a structure reduces their anxiety about having those conversations and really helps them know where they're going in the conversation. So um, the best way to do this is to really uh, ask people to share and feel very, uh, be very specific to say, you know, it's okay if you had a negative reaction to the guide, share it with us, um, or a positive reaction. So, and we have materials that um, are available on the Meet Community Practice that talk about how you can respond to people who are um, perhaps being uh, difficult. So then the most crucial part of the training, which is, which is the role play. Um, can you use the conversation guide with uh, each other or they can use it with an actor and, and a facilitator. So the important part of this is that you first start and create a safe learning environment. So part of this is to discuss, um, you know, not using pagers and being attentive and also keeping, you know, using kind of Vegas rules, keeping what happens in the room to stay in the room. Um, and also remembering that everyone has something to learn about these conversations and everyone can improve. Um, acknowledging the awkwardness of role play is essential. So we have uh, materials that talk about what it's like, you know, we call it I hate role play. And, you know, when the, when the participants say, you know, it's really awkward and it's really, I'm in the hot seat and I don't like it. It's really important to acknowledge that all of those things are incredibly true. Um, and once you acknowledge that those things are true, then you can talk about why role play is so important. And uh, also that the feedback that we get is that every time is that role play should be longer, or it's the most useful part of the training, et cetera. Um, what we see as typical um, challenges in using the guide is um, just going off the guide, so just sort of going off on your own sort of tangent and not using it. Um, another very common um, mistake is to not give prognosis um, or to just start in with what's your understanding and forgetting about the setup and permission pieces. We've uh, revised the guide so that people are less likely to forget those steps. We made the setup a little simpler and given actual words. We've given words people can use, three different choices of prognosis to use. Um, and then we've even added a drill to show what it's like to stay on the guide. Um, I think it's really important that you have enough facilitators to give individual feedback and to make sure that everyone has enough time for practice. We initially started our practice with uh, letting everyone practice the entire guide. We now changed to people practicing about half the guide, um, and that seems to work as well. Um, we just added a drill into our um, teaching of the serious illness conversation guide, and I have to be—I uh, have to credit Elise Perry, one of my colleagues at the Mayo Clinic, with us adding this. It really. Uh, I have never used them before, and it's made an incredible difference. So a drill is a learning technique to use to practice a new skill that involves uh, either a teacher modeling a sentence or the learner repeating it. In our case, we have a, a sheet, um, and uh, it gives people the questions on the guide and then the patients, and, and we have them split up into pairs. Um, we, can, we can use it as a practice responding to emotion. We can use it to practice responding to resistance to using a guide. We can also use it to practice to show um, the technique of bookmarking. Earlier, um, as I was speaking, we talked about how um, people may, uh, you know, respond and say something about pain, and you may say something like, gosh, it's really important that we come back to your pain, but I want to continue with the guide. And so you're bookmarking the, the important um, thing that the patient brought up, but you're sticking on the script. Okay. And here's an example of our guide. 
You can see everything that's in white is actually straight off the guide itself. The shaded areas are areas that the clinician is saying something off the guide. So, um, you know, the patient said something like, I'm doing fine right now. Things are good. I don't need to have a big conversation. Um, and then the clinician does some normalizing. I do lists of all my patients because it helps me understand what's important to you. And I'm going to use this conversation guide to make sure we don't miss anything. Is that okay? Um, and so they're checking in for permission. Um, so after the illness understanding, I, I've been feeling better since I've been in the hospital, but I know there's a lot wrong with me, with my heart, lungs, and kidneys. <laughs> I know I don't have a lot of ways to make those better, but I'm a positive per person. I know I can get through this. I'm really impressed by your strength and positivity. So that's a statement sort of supporting the patient. Um, one of the things we noted when people use a drill is all their awkwardness and sort of, you know, they get out their sort of uh, negative reaction in the drill and then it allows them to go into role play and really feel much different. Um, so I think it's uh, a really great um, addition to our teaching uh, and we can post the drill if people want it on, onto the website. After you do the role play, you want to let people um, come together and share their key takeaways. Um, sometimes we'll do something like ask, asking the clinicians, was there anything that you were surprised by? Um, and then um, asking if there's any concerns they have. Um, the other thing that you want to do at the end of a training such as this is really give them the next step of what they're supposed to do. So we ask people to use the guide once in the next two weeks and to check in with a partner that's with at their training um, and, and to check in with them. I think that really gives them a to-do and make sure that they use the guide before their skills get too, uh, too rusty. Okay, so now we have another poll, and we'll go ahead and do that. Yeah, so the second poll is just about what methods you use to train other clinicians. Uh, I know Rochelle and I have talked to a few people, and there's great methods out there that yeah. people are using, so we'd love to hear from you. So we'll give you about uh, a minute to answer this poll. Um, what I want to say as you're answering this, hopefully it's not too distracting, is I heard a lot of great resources and tips uh, that Rochelle mentioned. And so just for you all to know, uh, actually that demonstration video is also available on the community of practice if uh, you would like to use it in your uh, training. So it's right under the videos tab. Uh, it's 12 minutes, I think, long. Um, and it's there and available for use. Um, as Rochelle mentioned, um, a lot of these materials are also on there and they're right under the resources tab. Um, sometimes I find it easier to filter um, because we now have quite a few resources on there. So, um, sorry, there's like a party going out on outside our door. So, um, if you hear that, they're just really enjoying the webinar, I think. Um, so, if you go under, back to where the resources are, if you go into the resources and filter by um, implementation I believe it's implementation support material. I'll double check on that. Then, um, you know, some of those uh, skills training cases and other training support materials are in there. So thank you for answering the poll. Uh, those, as you know, that's closed and the results are in. Um, you guys use most of the methods. So um, you all have used reflection, didactic, um, 75% of you have done the live demonstration and an equal number have done the video. Um, so role play with a, a facilitator feedback, everyone has done, about half have done role play without facilitator feedback. Um, everyone has done large group debriefing. Um, about a quarter have done one-on-one -on -one in person training. Um, no one has done online training yet. Um, I have talked to some people who have tried. Um, and then one person has done a new method that hasn't been recommended here, which we'd love to hear about. Um, and we all know that you've already actually have done training. So with that, I think it's, it's going. To, I think it's going to John. Yes. Um, so we'll hand it over to you, John. 
Oh, I'm just kidding because <laughs> I didn't move the slide yet. But we actually want to hear from you, um, and we would love to hear. We just I just listed off all the methods that um, you've used to train um, each other. So if anyone would like to share um, some of those, you can either raise your hand um, or chat us in. I actually know, um, Judy, you messaged us before that um, you've been doing the two-hour training and it's been well received. Um, do you have any sort of success stories or challenges um, that you would like to share, you can either raise your hand or chat. Oh. We'll work on unmuting your line, Judy. We're just having some uh, technical. There we go. Judy, can Hi. you? Uh, there we go. Hello. <laughs> so we've been doing two hours instead of three hours um, because the clinicians requested a shorter version. So we shrank the didactic to the first hour, and the second hour is just role play. And we've been doing a four to one ratio. Um, uh, one trainer to four attendees, and what the trainers, some of them, not all of them do it this way, but some of them have found it useful to have two um, role plays going on simultaneously, and the master trainer sort of listens in on both, and then when both teams are done, they do a debriefing together. Great. What have been some of the challenges you've experienced? Well, it was hard to shrink it to two hours, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering how that went, yeah. Uh, it um, was to do that, but I, I do think it's been successful, uh, and people do get uh, enough out of it. Um, one of the things that I found really helpful was having each clinician uh, role play as a patient, because I one of the feedbacks I got was the clinician said uh, he forgot how scared the patients feel. Yeah. And so I thought that was very uh, important. Um, in terms of challenges, it's, it's always been scheduling the time to get people to show up. Uh, for us, we've had success with 7 to 9 a.m. Or a dinner meeting, which you know, mm -hmm. 8 p.m. Um, but it's it's very hard to get in the middle of the day. Yeah, we've been able to do the middle of the day by um, we were able to convince our leadership that this was important and for them to buy out, uh, you know, their session right after lunch. Um, so we've been we've done a lot during the middle of the day, um, and it's been pretty. People have been pretty engaged. Um, or, or first thing in the morning, like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. We haven't had so much luck with getting people in Boston. At least we haven't done too many at the end of the day. So that's great to hear. Thanks for sharing. Okay. Is there anyone else that would like to share your experience and what other method you might have? Um, a new method that we didn't mention or um, – any other challenges or successes in training? Okay, so we're going to move on. So we're going to um, pass this over to John Yu as um, Kyan introduced and really learn how to adapt the training program. John did an amazing job um, at his facility doing this. So, John, I think you have control now of the slides, um, and we'll hand it over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Can folks hear me? Yeah, we can. Perfect. Um, let me try to advance the slide. 
Perfect. So, uh, yes, yeah, thanks for the introduction at the beginning of the webinar, Kang. Kang. Um, it really is a privilege to co-present this with uh, the team here. Um, as was in introduced at the beginning, I am, uh, I am a hospitalist physician up in Canada, and we've had some experience over the past year adapting and implementing the serious illness care program for a hospital setting. Um, and so very glad to talk about um, this uh, concept of adapting the training program to your local setting. So, uh, looks like there is a poll. Yeah, so we're gonna launch that right now. Um, and just two, questions, two parts of the question. So if you've adapted the training for your setting, and if so, what adaptations? And so that should be live. Um, we'll have about a minute to fill it out, um, and then we'll let you all know of the results. All right, about five more seconds to so complete the poll, and then um, it's all right. So it looks like actually uh, three quarters of you have adapted the training, which is great because, um, as Judy told us, a lot of it is based on physician uh, requirements of your organization and other things. And so those adaptations made have include altering the learning objectives, uh, changing the slides or handouts, great. Um, I can't imagine walking around with all our logos and needs, mm -hmm. and then changing the amount of time for role play and exercise. So John, we're gonna hand it back over to you to continue on. Super. Um, so, you know, based on the poll results, sounds like there have been quite a bit uh, of different adaptations that folks have made. Um, if uh, people want to share with us uh, what some of those uh, adaptations have been, if we have a couple of minutes um, where, where we can discuss that. Just have to use the uh, raise your hand function. I guess uh, our team uh, at Area Annual will help to work the um, technical side of that. Can I ask Rochelle too, do you, have you guys adapted the training for other settings? So we've adapted for a couple of different reasons. Um, one, we adapted when we went to our hospitalists. We found it really important to use cases that work in your setting. So when we uh, train in oncology, we use oncology cases. When we train in primary care, we use multimorbidity cases. Um, in the hospital setting, we use patients with frequent hospitalizations. Um, so I think that's really key for the patients to feel like they're patients, and we have examples of that. Um, and if you need cases, just let us know. We can post them on this community of practice, and some of them are already there. Um, the other way we've adapted, um, MGH has actually taken the guide, and they've actually adapted the guide um, and changed it. Um, and made it a little shorter for their PCPs and got a few of the questions. So we've had to uh, adapt in that way to training with a slightly different guide. So we've done lots of adaptations um, and uh, lots of learning with that as well. Have you ever adapted the role play time? That's a question we get a lot. And what is your like? I think that any less than an hour is not enough. Um, and so even even um, even if you don't have actors, I think you you know not I've I've heard of patient, of people just doing didactic, and I would not consider that training per se. Mm -hmm. um, so Alexandra um, typed in too, and she she mentioned that they added times for goals of care information, 
and uh, and their process, I'm guessing the implementation process, and now it's a total of actually three and a half hours. Um, you've modified some of the cases um, as some of the instructions, as people found them difficult to follow. Um, if you don't mind, I'm sort of wondering in which setting you might have um, trained clinicians in, meaning like specialty um, setting. Well, if you could share the cases as well, um, it might help other people. You can send them to us and we're happy to share them um, if, you count, if you've been able to simplify them and they're easier for people to use. Um, but that's, that's great, especially if you've gotten three and a half hours. Um, I know I've worked with some health systems that got in it. The, a day long training <laughs> um, to encompass more about uh, communication skills in general and also specific on the guide. Um, but I think Judy is probably more of our typical uh, cutting the training time <laughs> for the batting it. So, John, um, we'll try to keep on, make sure you can get through your important information and what you've done as well. So, we'll, we'll make sure I hand it, we're going to hand it back over to you now. Sure, sounds great. Um, so, onwards with the presentation. Uh, thanks for sharing this, everyone. Um, so, why that's the training? Um, I mean, every setting is different, um, and the different audiences are different, and I've actually had a chance to do training with not only our hospitalist group as the main group, but different other groups, like nephrology clinicians and uh, first-year internal medicine residents and um, uh, medical students, and so um, certainly adaptation is necessary. Um, so a mix of different clinical responsibilities and workflows, um, challenges in having these conversations might be quite different depending on the context um, and can be addressed in the training. So for example, quite different challenges in the hospital setting compared to in a family practice setting. Um, and uh, Similarly, what motivates clinicians to have these conversations, conversations in one particular, set, one particular setting can be different compared to another. Uh, and then finally, there are different resource constraints that may impact how you will train clinicians. You know, do you have the resources to have standardized patients or actors, for instance? So what are the different steps that can be taken um, to um, adapt the training. So there's four here uh, that we've highlighted. One, um, which uh, is, I think is one of the most important ones on the slide actually, is to understand your audience. Um, so you can really get buy-in and engagement from them during the training. Um, secondly, develop a training plan, um, operational but important. Three, write a curriculum with learning objectives and a lesson plan. And then importantly, after each training, to evaluate um, the experience uh, so that you can improve for the next time. So understanding your audience, um, you know, things like uh, where do they struggle with this kind of communication? What makes this hard? Um, what constraints do we need to work around uh, to be able to conduct the training? Um, so we heard an example uh, just earlier about uh, the need to try to keep it a bit shorter to two hours. Um, are there any levers that you have available that can motivate clinicians? Um, what are the programs might exist for them that could be either competing or synergistic? Um, I would say from my experience, um, one of the most important parts in um, preparing for our training um, was um, at the bottom of the slide here, the one-on-one -on -one conversations early. So before we had our first training and before we launched the uh, implementation of the serious illness care program on our, our hospitalist uh, unit at my hospital, um, I had a, a number of one-on-one -on -one conversations, not just with leadership, but with my colleagues, um, hospitalist colleagues. Uh, to ask, to invite them to be part of this initiative and also uh, to get their advice um, on what would work well in terms of not only the training itself but also the implementation 
and um, got some um, great information and advice um, during those conversations. And I also think that the one-on-one -on -one interactions are critically important to set yourself up for success uh, for the whole implementation piece. But as it relates to the training itself, um, you know, in, in, our, in our context, and I don't know, I'm sure many people have similar things. Um, in Canada, I mean, there's a push to more um, interactive uh, continuing medical, medical education for physicians and a certain type of credit for continuing uh, medical education. Um, and so one advice for us was to make sure that we would have the training accredited for this uh, harder to get but more valuable CME credit. Um, that was just one example of the kind of advice we got during the, the planning. Another thing that struck us during the, my one-on-one -on -one conversations with colleagues because I was interacting with hospitalists was sort of some of the pushback about, um, well, yeah, this sounds great, John, but um, you know, have you thought about uh, trying to engage uh, the family physicians or the primary care physicians because wouldn't it be great if they could have these conversations before the patients land up in the hospital? Um, and so I acknowledged those concerns and agreed with them that that would be a great place for the conversations, but also um, uh, took the position that this is sort of everybody's business and that um, we need to own part of, part of this issue. Um, so I think those one-on-one -on -one conversations were very important. Um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, developing a training plan, you know, and you need to make it fit your own local constraints, uh, what resources you have available, what your local needs are. Um, when we started doing this a year ago, actually I, um, I think the recommended time was two and a half hours, so we, we've been sticking to two and a half hours. But actually I do find it difficult to get it um, uh, done in a fulsome way in two and a half hours, so I'm kind of reassured to see the three hours there. Um, we've done all of ours face-to-face, -face, um, and we've always done ours with uh, the three-to-one ratio which we find works very well. And we've always done quite small groups, so either three or nine learners at a time with uh, a three-to-one ratio with facilitators, um, <clears throat> with the exception of the first-year residents when we trained 24 people at once, and that was quite, uh, quite a bit organized. Um, so uh, this is uh, just a reminder that, um, you know, training itself, um, uh, of course, is critical, but uh, all by itself is not enough. And uh, certainly, our experience impl implementing the program over the last year, I would certainly agree that if you stop at the training, um, it's much harder to achieve uh, real impact um, in clinical practice. Um, the third step uh, in terms of um, adapting your training uh, to your local setting is to choose uh, objectives. Um, so write down your uh, objectives for training and the lesson plan. And here are just uh, some examples um, uh, in terms of some sample objectives that could be used uh, for a training session. Oops, next slide, here we go. And yeah, I, I think of the four um, different aspects of adapting and uh, the training for your environment, I, I think this is the, uh, another key point um, is the issue of um, evaluating and improving continually your training. Um, even though I felt like we spent um, um, maybe just enough time to uh, prepare for our first training a year ago, um, there's certainly a lot that we still learned after we started training. Um, and so having the debrief internally soon after uh, the training session uh, to see how things went and where things could go better um, and get some uh, informal and informal feedback from the people who participated in the sessions uh, so that you can improve in the future. Um, I think I would say um, my biggest learning in um, doing the training is that in the very early days, we um, I don't think we were diligent enough about making sure that people really stuck to the guide um, as faithfully as possible. 
Um, and you know, certain, sometimes clinicians have a way of um, wandering off uh, the structure or the language of the guide. And I think in the very early days, we uh, gave them too much free reign. And in retrospect, uh, when we went to implementing on the ward um, and trying to engage some of these colleagues uh, to have these conversations with patients, um, I think in looking back, I think it was a real missed opportunity to be able to sort of stop people during the role play and say, hey, I, I noticed that uh, you're using some language that's, that's different from what's uh, in the guide, and why don't we try going back? Um, and so um, I think there were some lessons that we learned, and I certainly would advocate for continually evaluating and improving uh, as you go along. Um, I think at this point it is time to pass the ball over to uh, back to Rochelle. So, yeah, you? thank you so much, John. Um, I think you gave all the lessons. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so concisely and so yeah. nicely. So I think Rochelle, the ball yeah. is back with you. So you can thank you on. so much, John. Thanks for being so honest <laughs> about. You know, I think we didn't learn that lesson early enough either about getting people back onto the guide and really. Um, I think the most effective way I've been able to do that is to say, hey, we're trying something new here, and could you go back to the guide? <laughs> to be very directive um, and, and to sort of point out where they are and what they might have missed. And so um, we're, we're actually experimenting with new ways to train trainers to do this um, with some kind of quick coaching techniques um, and sort of even just like pointing, hey, you're, this is where you are in the guide, go back here. Um, so, I also loved your point about um, internally debriefing. I think it's incredibly important uh, in keeping your program fresh and really improving it each time. So, um, I think that's really key. So, thanks so much for sharing. Okay. So, um, let's see. So, lots of logistical challenges. So, scheduling is probably the biggest one. Um, I think the best thing that we've done in order to get scheduling challenges is to get our leadership buy-in to get a three-hour block um, and to get some, uh, at least we in, in the U.S. we have RVUs um, and to get our leadership to buy out the RVUs for clinicians to be trained. Um, so that's been incredibly helpful. Um, we have tried splitting it into a couple of different um, times, but or we haven't found that to be as effective as doing it in one big block. I think I've heard about other places, you know, doing the lecture and then doing the role play at a different time, but I think there's something that's lost a little bit um, if, if you do it that way. We always, always are looking for more trainers. We're working on a national level with Vital Talk now to um, train more trainers um, so that we can uh, roll this out at scale. Um, and then it's really, really important to make sure you manage the time during the sessions. Um, if you have a project manager or assistant um, or anyone really in the group to help you with the timing, I think that's really important. You, they can hold up a little card, you know, or just raise their hand and say, I think we need to move on now. But I think it's really critical to keep things moving and stick to a very tight timeline. Uh, the other challenges are naysayers. Um, you know, I think first, if they have a, a valid point to really emphasize, um, you know, that that's valid. Um, and then turn to the group. Um, if, if someone said, oh, it didn't help me much, you know, sometimes you can say, well, did it didn't help anyone in the group. And generally I've had, and, and it's a little risky, but, but uh, people have been able to say, yes, uh, you know, this helped me because I had a structure. Um, and then again, the, the role play challenges, which we, we sort of talked about. Um, we, uh, you know, the biggest thing I think in the training that's challenging is the prognosis and clinicians are not really as comfortable estimating it. And even when people practice, they can't even say it. So we do teach people to uh, give it a prognosis in a form of a range weeks to months. And to remember that the focus of that prognostication is not on being right, but on helping patients prepare in case time is short. Um, and then we also have sometimes uh, pointed people to online tools like ePrognosis.org that can help clinicians 
figure out, um, you know, timing of prognosis and risk of death. Um, we've actually taken to giving people the prognostic words um, exactly, and we found that this is really, really helpful. So, um, we, you know, I want to share my understanding of where things are with your illness. Um, and of course, this is after we've said, how much information do you want from me? So once you've gotten permission from the patient to uh, share prognosis, you can say something like, and we added these uncertain uh, and function prognoses after working with our nurses in our ICMP program and found that, you know, time-based prognoses were not certainly not within the realm of a typical nursing practice, but uncertainty and function were. So uncertainty, it can be difficult to predict what will happen with your illness. I hope you could continue to live well for a long time, but I'm worried that you could get sick quickly, and I think it's important to prepare for that possibility. Time, I wish we were not in this situation, but I'm worried that time might be as short as weeks to months, months to a year, or function. I hope this is not the case, but I'm worried this may be as strong as you will feel and things are likely to get more difficult. Um, some people may not think of those uncertainty and function prognoses as prognoses themselves, but I think they actually give uh, patients, if delivered in the right way, uh, a lot of information and can help them plan. Um, I think the other concern is that, um, you know, sometimes people worry they're not the right person to be sharing the prognosis. If you're the PCP, should the cardiologist do it? Should the oncologist do it? I think, you know, if you are this patient's clinician uh, and you feel comfortable with the patient, you certainly can share um, prognoses. Um, and if you don't feel comfortable, you can work with a colleague who does. You know, if you're a social worker, uh, you work with your nurse practitioner colleague or physician colleague and uh, make sure that uh, that it is shared and that the patient does understand. Because it's difficult to plan if patient doesn't have a realistic understanding of what their prognosis is. Okay. So um, we have a little bit, a few minutes for discussion and any questions um, that people might have. Um, as maybe you're raising your hand or typing it in, um, just sort of reflecting on the wonderful webinar that Rochelle and John just gave and thinking about all the key lessons that I'm hearing um, and just how, you know, adaptation is so important for training as well. I know this is something that we say in all of our webinars, but that um, I don't know that people think about in terms of training as well. Um, and so hearing that, as a really important, who's your audience? What are their needs? Um, as something that I take away. Um, Judy, I saw that maybe uh, you rose your hand. Maybe we can try unmuting your line to see if you have any questions. Um, we'll unmute it right now. Hi, uh, sorry about that. I, I was just going to let you guys know that uh, clinicians have found a laminated guides very um, helpful and we have recently just made the uh, pocket size ones that they also like as well. Great to know. Have you got, used the laminated in training as well? Uh, just to show them. Okay. Good to know. Great. That's wonderful. Good tips and information that we have to pass on. Absolutely. Thank you. So um, I want to respect Time. You can continue typing in or raise your hand, but we're going to open one last poll and just to get your feedback um, for this webinar, John's uh, point of continual monitor and improvement, um, we're trying to meet that or reach that goal as well. So if you could um, just take the short feedback poll um, on a scale of one to five, did this webinar meet your needs? And then um, any sort of even if it did meet your needs, feedback is also welcome. Um, there's a type your answer here and it's uh, open uh, ended response. Um, so about just about another minute to answer that. Um, this page shows um, just that you can type in the answer for the short answer. We did want to let you know that we do have another webinar coming up on Tuesday, May 22nd. It's actually our last webinar of this academic year. Um, we sort of take a break for the summer, lots of vacations and um, 
arresting going on. So this one will be on measurement and monitoring, and the presenters will actually be Jane Cavanaugh and Laura Subnerian, I'm gonna say her name on, and I already apologize to her, uh, who's a monitoring and evaluation specialist here at Ariadne Lab. Um, so you'll see that invite um, come out very soon, and we hope you all can join. Um, and just, I wanna again thank Rochelle and John um, for presenting this really important topic today that we get a lot of questions on. Fantastic, thanks everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.